Hey there, Brad. If these guys crash together like goats, uh, wouldn't they like stab each other with the heads? Uh, well, yes. There are some Triceratops skulls with fossil evidence of scars on the face from fights with other Triceratopses. Any got any holes in the heads there, though? Oh, what kind of holes do you mean? Between the eyes, man. Uh, like a bad dude went boom. I rolled a herd now. Uh, no. Uh, for real? All those Triceratops that lived over millions of years and nobody went for the brainstem? Well, I can't say that none of them tried, but there's no fossil evidence of that exact method. I don't know that, Brad. Uh, I think it might be worth uh, investigating. How do you suggest we carry out this investigation? Get your safari pack, because we're going to the wilds of the Natural History Museum. Back, 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 back. This is incredible! There's some big horns up there! Uh, and a lot of them have those holes I was talking about! Well, they have holes, but those holes aren't battle wounds. Scientists think that those may have helped lighten the skulls because they're so massive. Oh, that makes sense! Yeah, and they think that maybe there were membranes of skin that covered the whole frill with blood vessels near the surface for communicating to each other so they could tell other members of their species that they were in danger, or pick up a mate. So, uh, the frill is kind of like a billboard, but instead of saying, uh, eat at Jack's Crab Shack, exit 224, it says, hey, get away from my herd, you T-Rexes. Yeah, that's the basic idea. So, why do all those Triceratops look so different? Like, some got big horns, and some almost have no horns, and, uh, some of the horns aren't even facing the right way. Yeah, that's a good question, Otis. What are those horns for when they're pointing backwards? Well, I can help answer that question. Wow! Where did you come from? <laughs> hey, look, it's our friend Josh Matthews, who's the director of paleontology here at the Burpee Museum. Oh, hey there, Josh. I'm Otis. It's nice to meet you. Good to meet you, too. I heard you guys talking, and I thought I'd help explain a few things. So Please. Each one of these skulls up here are unique species from the group of horned dinosaurs. So, uh, there's nine types of horned dinosaurs in here? Ten, including my buddy Homer. And these are just a few of the, the group of dinosaurs called the Ceratopsians, or the horned dinosaurs. So, I have a question. Since this whole family of dinosaurs is named after their horns, they must be really important features. But we couldn't figure out what some of them are used for if they're pointing their backwards. Let's think about modern animals today that have horns and antlers. A bison, a deer, uh, elk? Are they using them to stab predators? No, uh, they use those to get each other's attention, like we talked about in the colored frills. You got it, Otis. Seems like for horns and frills, they're more likely used for communication and identification rather than like a sword or a shield. But if they need to serve a defensive purpose, I'm sure they won't hesitate to use their heads. Well, what about those skulls over here? Uh, you tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think those actually look like they're all Triceratops. Correct again, Otis. Let's go take a look. Alright, I'm on a roll. This is what we call a growth series, where each skull out here represents a different stage of growth in Triceratops. So what ages are represented by each growth stage? We don't have a really good grasp on aging Triceratops at this time, but we generally refer to them as a toddler, a youngling, a teenager like Homer here, and an adult. Their horns are all different shapes. What's up with that? Well, as Triceratops grow, their horns undergo drastic changes. They start off as tiny little nubs, and as they grow, they begin to curve backwards. 
That's awesome. It looks like Loki's helmet. You know Loki, right? Always causing trouble for Thor and the Avengers, that Loki. But as they continue to grow, they start to reorient forward to where eventually they'll cause a lot of troubles for potential predators. In fact, a recent study on, on Tyrannosaurus Rex suggests that T-Rex used the frill as a lever to rip the head off, exposing that tender neck meat. Wow! Then those dinosaurs with the little horns and the frills really are protecting their necks. They really are. If you look closely at this little guy over here, you'll see tiny little bone tri triangles along the margin of the frill. As that animal grows, those triangles begin to flatten out to where you can hardly see them in an adult, like over here. Aww, they're so nice of evolution, they help the little guy. I got another Triceratops skull in collections much smaller than Homer. You guys want to go check it out? Yeah, yeah let's, let's check, check it, it out. out. Let's go. Here we are in the museum's collection area, where they store the fossils they find for researchers to come and study them. And Josh has an interesting fossil to show us. What we have here is our latest Triceratops skull. This is the Garni skull. What we have here is the frill, which is the shield part of the skull. And on the right here, we have the left squamosal. So the left squamosal is one of the bones of the skull. What's unique about this bone is it has some weird bumps and grooves in it. You see a long mark here, this really rough area here. So this area right here is really rough and rugose. This shouldn't be like this, it should be really smooth. This I believe to be a bone infection. The only way to diagnose whether it's a bone infection or not is to get a CAT scan done. CAT scan? I thought we were talking about dinosaurs! No, 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 we're not going to scan your cat. We're going to take oh, this bone to the it. hospital it. and we're going to run it through an instrument that takes very millimeter scans of the internal structure of the bone. When we get a hundreds, sometimes thousands of those scans, we stack them together, you get a 3D image, and then you can look inside and see what's going on inside the bone and what's happening. Oh wow, so you're telling me it takes thousands of pictures to know what's going on inside that little thing? Sometimes it can. This wow. happens in humans too. If you break a bone, if you have uh, something going on in your head, they'll put you through the CT scanner and, and take those little millimeter slices through your, the internal structure of your head or your arm, whatever's broken, and use the same treatment to diagnose injuries in humans. Oh, wow. I, I got a cousin. You might want to scan his brain, too. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty wild. Hey, uh, you got any other cool things that we can look at down here? We do have several. All right. Hey, let's go take a look, man. Let's do it. All right. So we're here looking at more of the skull from Garney the Triceratops to see what else we can learn from his other skull bones. So what we have here is the, more of the front of Garney's skull. In the back that you just saw, that was the shield or the frill of the Triceratops. So we here we got the horns and some of the cheekbones and some other bones. Hey, uh, yeah, yeah, well, what, what is this uh, spaceship looking bone over here? This guy right here? Yeah, this weird looking thing. Well, this is no spaceship, believe it or not. This is a brain case. So this is the back of, the, the back of Garney's skull. So the first vertebrae in the backbone would attach right here. And see this little opening there? You sure do. That's where the spinal cord would enter the brain. And Whoa. Garney's brain would sit right here. That's wild. It is wild. And these little wings in your spaceship here, yeah, these are actually sense. processes that buttress the frill. So you'll have that big shield up here. These things make hold those these things hold the shield in place. Oh, wow. Hey, Brad, that's where the lasers would go on my spaceship. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's why I'm looking. So that's the brain case. The other cool things we have here are what are the most notable uh, things in a Triceratops? My, my favorite part. Brad, my favorite part. It's your favorite, the stabby part. The stabby part. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. This is the horn. Whoa. So this is Garney's right orbital horn. So orbital means above the eye. And in fact, this guy right here that's the, or that's the eyeball. What? You tell me his eyeball goes there? Yep, that's the upper part of the eyeball. And what's oh. interesting about this guy is just like the frill, it's got what we have, it's got pathologies, much like the frill back there. So you see these really weird bumps here, those shouldn't <laughs> be here. So if you look at that one, and then you grab the other one really quick. Oh, wow. It's nice and smooth. You don't see those bumps like you do on this one. So this, an injury occurred sometimes while, while Garney was alive. Again, it looks like they rehealed, but just like with the frill, we're going to CAT scan this guy too. Yeah, that's right. See what's going on in there, huh? And by doing that, we can see 
exactly what happened to this horn. And if it survived, it kind of looks like it regrew. You look like you survived it, but we won't know until we get that CT done. Oh, wow, man, that's awesome. Thank you for showing us that. You betcha, pretty cool stuff, huh? Yeah. What's that sharp object you got over there, buddy? It looks like a tooth. This guy here? Yeah, that guy right there. That's not a tooth. Remember how we were talking about the little spiky things on the back of the frill? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one of those guys. This is an epoxipital or epipariatal. These are the little horns. English, buddy, English. That's what they're called, man. Okay. They're little horns that Can you say it one more time just so I get it? Epoxipital. 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 Okay. I, I, I think I got it. I think you got it. I think I got it. So the back of the frill, these would be all over. They'd probably have 10 to 15 of these guys wow, all around the back a lot. of the frill. Yeah, it's a lot. As the animals get larger and bigger, they flatten out and they don't really have this point. So we can tell just by looking at this piece right here, this was a younger animal, not a full adult, because it's pointy. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Man, the things you know just by observation. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's just like the points that we saw in the cast of the small skull upstairs of the Triceratops. Yeah! In the growth series. Yeah! Oh man, I'm learning so much today. <laughs> Alright, let's go see what else we can find to talk about in the collections. Let's go! Alright then, Josh. Level with me here. What's with this box of rocks? This actually isn't a box of rocks at all. All these little things that you call rocks are actually fossils from many different animals. We got Triceratops, we got T-Rex, we got little mammals, we got fish scales, we got crocodile fossils, all in this little box. They look like little rocks, but they're not. They're from animals that once lived 66 million years ago. Wow. But, 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 but wait, answer me this, Josh. How did all these little critters come to be living in the same place? Well, these animals probably didn't live in the exact same place. They were washed together. So if you look at the little little sediments here, this is all really fine sands. So this was part of, part of a river or a stream system. So as the river's flowing, as the river takes a bend and a curve, on the inside of that bend, the energy in the river decreases. When that river decreases, all the little fine particles, whether they're fossils or rocks, fall to the ground and accumulate in these little areas. So these probably lived upstream, some way, it could have been close, could have been far, but they were washed down river and buried in one place together. So all these little fossils give us a snapshot of the ecosystem living underneath the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are cool, but there were lots of other animals underneath their feet. And this gives us a good representation of what that ecosystem looked like. Oh, wow, that's crazy. Hey, you know, I went whitewater rafting once. Didn't turn out too good for me. Probably never do it again. Uh, well, but that's really awesome, man. At least you didn't turn into a fossil, right? Yeah, right. Thank goodness. Oh my gosh, more stabby things. Please tell me all about them. Well, these stabby things here are called air scribes. Air scribes are essentially mini jackhammers. So when we turn them on... Whoa! What is that? That's crazy noise, man. <laughs> these are what we use to get the fossils out of the rock. So if you notice here, this is a big chunk of rock. Over here, this is bone. Whoa! So this, hock, this rock here is really hard. You could use dental tools, you could use hand tools. Problem is, it's going to take you a long time to do it. Yeah. So when I we bet. use the stabby things or the air scribes, we can. I like stabby things. <laughs> we can we can work through the rock much quicker. And as we get closer to the bone, if if there's a good separation between the dirt, the sediment, and the bone, as we get closer with the tools, the vibrations will pop those rocks right off the surface, and you have a nice smooth surface to the bone. So we do this. We carefully use the tools to remove any rock from the bones to basically. Get them out of their rock tubes. So when you're preparing these things, you got to be extra careful not to hit any of that real bone there. Get that rock off That's nice and clean, huh? Absolutely correct, because these yeah. things can do a lot of damage. And you'll notice here... We have wait, wait. They can? Lots of damage. Yeah, i got some ideas here, you buddy. Like damage. <laughs> but if you notice, we have various different sizes. So this is pretty good size. We have a little bit smaller one. Oh, wow. And they have a really teeny tiny one here. For very it is soft. very teeny tiny. This is for very soft and very delicate rock and with bones. So there's certain certain fossils like fish fossils oh. are very delicate. Wow. So we'll use these for for uh, cases like that. Wow. But if you have really hard rock that it's you know really difficult you, to get the rocks out of, you need something more aggressive. You gotta bust a big boy out. That's yeah, right. That's, that's right. right. So these all these tools here are used to to remove bones from their rocks. Now as we get closer to the bone, you can switch 
over to hand tools and not use the stabby things. Um, but these work well at getting m much of the bulk removal, the big, the big chunks like, of rock. I would imagine if you used the hand tools, it would take a very long time. It would take a very long time, yeah. especially if the rock is really, really hard. Well, that's good. You so, got some tools to handle the business then. That's right. We need yeah. lots of tools in this business. Awesome. Well, thank you for showing me those. That's You're awesome. Welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. So once you get all the rock off of the fossils, they're not quite ready to go out on the exhibits yet, right? Typically no. It depends on where you're, where you're getting the fossils from, the hardness of the rock, um, and the condition of the bone, whether they're really mineralized or they're relatively soft. Um, in this case, this is a, a femur, so a leg bone to a sauropod dinosaur, one of the long neck dinosaurs, from a different locality. Not where Triceratops is from, but this is much older. This is from the Jurassic uh, period. And this bone is much more heavily mineralized than any of the things where the Triceratops come from. And often you see them busted up in, in, in pretty rough condition. So in this case, it's a big, somewhat of a puzzle. The bones are broken, you gotta get the fits tight to make them, you know, get together to the point where you can get a good exhibit piece. And that's what we're doing here. This bone is in pretty rough shape, so my fossil preparator has been taking the, the puzzle pieces out piece by piece, cleaning them off individually, and he'll assemble them later um, into into the uh, exhibit quality piece, and that's what's what's going on here. All right, great. Well, thank you for showing all the steps of this process from finding things out in the field to digging them out, yeah, getting thanks, them Josh. to the museum, cleaning them up so they can go on the exhibits for us to see. You're welcome. Paleontologists, you gotta be kidding me.